Welcome everyone. Um, agenda for today, uh, for my talk, uh, I will start saying something about me and this research in particular. Then I'll go a bit uh, about uh, into the theory or the background of this research. So I'll discuss what browser fingerprinting and cloaking is. Then I'll go into the pro problem statement for this research, research questions and our contributions. Uh, specifically, I'll go into two particular uh, contributions. I'll close off with a reflection and, and future work, and I'll also say a bit about what happened since I did this research because it was performed uh, a while back. About me, my name is Jeroen Pinois. I have about 10 years of experience in software testing, system administration, incident response, and CTI. I used to work at Swift, a financial telecom telecommunications company. And uh, about a year ago, I switched positions to another large international organization where I'm currently the MISP engineer. So I maintain a couple of MISP instances and their relevant uh, communities. About this research, uh, I did this research while I was working. Uh, it's a master thesis, or it was done in, as in scope of a master thesis at the uh, Open Universiteit Nederland. It's a Dutch university focusing on distance education. Um, my, yeah, I just wanted to point out that actually at this university, in this master's, the thesis is quite a large part of the, the study, 40 ECTS, which is the equivalent of about 1,000 hours of work. I think in practice I spend more than that, so it's uh, just to indicate it's not a one or two weeks uh, work that I did. My primary supervisor was uh, Dr. Hugo Jonker, who focuses mainly on browser fingerprinting and privacy online. Uh, for example, asking questions like, if I go to a, a website and I'm trying to buy a product and someone else is doing the same thing, does they, uh, do they, for example, get a different price based on their profile and, and other things <laughs> like that? Uh, he also looks into forensics uh, and other security topics. This research was performed between 2019 and 2021. So that's uh, in part during the COVID pandemic, which had some influence as well on the, the research. And it was before the advent of ChatGPT. So nothing like that was used. Uh, first of all, what is browser fingerprinting? So definition is here, but in short, uh, it's using some technologies on the web server and the web client, so a browser to collect some attributes about the browser and then use that to identify the browser or re-identify re the browser later on. So you have two phases. First of all, you collect and store fingerprints of a browser and then you use it to re-identify a matching client. You can also, instead of collecting the browsers this way, you're waiting for connections and then doing the fingerprinting. You can also use research to determine what a browser fingerprint would look like of the suspected victim, for example. What can you uh, fingerprint with this kind of technologies? Uh, we call this web identities. So actually, it's not just the browser you can fingerprint, but also the underlying system or even the user that's uh, using that system. Examples of attributes that you can use to fingerprint is uh, a user agent, Inst the list of installed fonts, list of installed plugins, etc. There's a very large list of these, and there's a lot of research into what attributes of a browser you can fingerprint. Uh, so I'm just going to refer here to the last or the URL that's on the screen, which is miunique.org. It's a publicly available website, which when you uh, go to it and you say, yes, I want to collect a, a fingerprint, then it will show you whether your fingerprint is unique and also a bunch of attributes that it could determine uh, from the server side. One particularly interesting example of this, uh, which is fairly unique, is the uh, HTML5 canvas. Uh, basically, in 2012, some research was published which showed that you could use HTML5 API to create this kind of picture. And then from the browser, you can actually collect this fingerprint, uh, this canvas image, send it to the uh, server, and that can be used to uniquely identify you. This, the, the image that's created is fairly unique in that sense. And this is kind of the goal. Uh, what we're trying to achieve with this browser fingerprinting is to identify a browser, a user, or a system. And basically, we collect a bunch of attributes and play this game, guess who, 
if I know more and more about you, finally, if I collect, uh, combine all these attributes, I can say, okay, I see this uh, browser coming in with these attributes, and this browser is that browser that I've seen before. So, like in Guess Who, you uh, combine a bunch of different attributes, what color hair do they have, do they wear a hat or not, and in the end, you get to one single individual that's identified. What kind of characteristics do we use to be able to do that? Um, so there's two main characteristics of fingerprints. The first one is it has to be unique. The set of uh, the specific browser that you're trying to fingerprint or its, it's uh, fingerprint has to be unique. So that means you, uh, if you stand out, it's easier to fingerprint you. For example, this yellow chair, if I point it out to you, you will immediately find it, but if I want to point you in towards one of the green chairs, it will be much more difficult because they all look the same. This brings us to one counter against browser fingerprinting. This particular one is used by the Tor browser, for example. Uh, Tor browser is making sure that uh, your browser looks as close to other browsers or other Tor browsers as possible without breaking functionality. So Tor browser is using a strategy called uh, conformity, so it's making uh, sure that the fingerprint is not unique. There's a lot of uh, browsers out there, systems out there using Tor browser and their fingerprint is all pretty similar. A second characteristic of a fingerprint is the stability. So if you want to collect a fingerprint on day one and then 14 days later you want to re-identify that same browser, that browser still needs to look somewhat similar to the original fingerprint because otherwise you cannot re-identify it. Uh, so how can you break that? By uh, changing your fingerprint over time. So there's a couple of browsers that use this strategy to counter fingerprinting. One of them is Brave. There's a bunch of uh, browser plugins you can install as well that will alter small details of your browser fingerprint and that makes sure or in an attempt to break this stability over time. Uh, there was a si famous serial killer in the US who used a similar strategy to avoid re-identification. So every time they caught him, these are all his mugshots. You see he looks slightly different and it was difficult for um, witnesses to recognize him. What are use cases of this fingerprinting? There's a couple of positive and negative ones, I would say. So sometimes it's a bit debatable whether something is positive or not. One of them, uh, I would say, so this is subjective, I would say. First of all, positive ca use cases, you can do a risk-based authentication. I have seen you before, you logged into my web, web page before, so this time uh, you don't need to use 2FA, multi-factor authentication to log in. If you are connecting from a new browser, I will ask you to use multi-factor authentication. Secondly, you can use that to alert uh, users of a potentially suspicious login Look, I spotted a new login coming from a browser with a very different profile from the ones you used to before, connect before. So maybe you want to look at this and confirm whether this activity was coming from you. Vulnerability scanning, you can look at systems, uh, determine the, the type of browser, version of the browser, know whether it's vulnerable or not to certain uh, exploits. And this can be positive if you're using it from a defend, uh, defender perspective to then do patching, for example, but it can also be negative if it's used by an opponent to, to know what, how to attack you. Another positive or negative, again, depends on your uh, point of view, uh, use case is bot detection. So there's a lot of crawlers out there that, let's imagine I'm a news site, I have journalists working for me, they are writing news articles, I don't just want someone to be able to crawl my entire web page, get all the uh, news articles, and then go through them without paying for anything. So this is a use case uh, for bot detection, for example. Negative, uh, targeted advertising is often using these kind of techniques. And then there's also a bunch of trackers online which are trying to track you, gather personal information about you, and then selling that. But the use case we are focused on in this research is a completely different one. It's called cloaking. And basically what it means is 
uh, you have malicious actors trying to deliver malware, for example, uh, and what they will do is use browser fingerprinting to only deliver malicious content in case they have a specific target uh, that they wanted to target passing by. And in other cases, they will show something completely different, which looks benign to the analyst or uh, the person visiting the website. A couple of examples. So this is an older one, a bootloader campaign. In the case, uh, so they were using um, a referrer, for example, to determine whether uh, a specific search query was used to search on Google, and then they reached this website. If, if so, uh, depending on the keywords used, if it was not the target they wanted, they would serve a page like this. So it's just some gibberish. It doesn't really mean much, but it just looks like a normal web page. There is nothing going on here. On the other hand, if they found uh, the target they wanted, they actually delivered this payload, which is something looking like a forum. Uh, I was maybe looking for some help with a certain uh, use case. I see this, I download the, the malware, and I run it. Um, so this is one example. This was from a while ago. However, there's a second example from this year, beginning of January, a uh, blog post men mentioning something similar. So here, cloaking was performed to, uh, again, deliver two different versions of the web page. In one particular case, it was uh, showing the phishing page, like this one. In the other one, it was showing a more generic, uh, different type of... Uh, of web page. What kind of flows do we have here uh, in, in cloaking? First of all, you have the no cloaking use case, so it's, uh, you request a web page, there is no filtering done on the server side, so you just get the normal content. However, you can also have server side, what we call server side cloaking, so in this case, only attributes which were originally sent to the server are used to do fingerprinting. An example would be using the user agent uh, or the IP and then determining based on that whether it's your target. For example, with an IP, you could do a geo lookup, determine the IP belongs to someone coming from Belgium. Okay, we didn't want to target Belgium, so we don't deliver the payload. Uh, another flow is client-side cloaking. So in this case, scripts are used also on the client side uh, to determine whether the payload should be sent. So what happens usually is some JavaScript is sent to the client. This JavaScript is run to uh, collect a bunch of fingerprint <laughs> attributes. And then the fingerprint uh, decides, okay, I want to get the malicious payload. It will download it from the web server. There is a variation to, uh, to this. Uh, so in this scenario, the, finger, the JavaScript would uh, run some collection send a result to the server, and then this result would be parsed by the server again to determine whether the payload uh, is delivered or not. So the, the biggest difference between these two is whether the client decides uh, if the, the malicious payload should be delivered or the server. Final theoretical part or background is a uh, Honey client. So one thing we can use to find these kind of pages or uh, pages in general that are delivering malware is what's called a Honey client. So a Honey client is the browser equivalent of a Honeypot server. So it's a, a browser that acts like a vulnerable web client. It will emulate some vulnerable functionality and then go to uh, scan the web in the hope of triggering some payloads. There is two different types of Honey clients, what's called a low interaction Honey client and a high interaction Honey client. Low interaction honey clients are emulated browsers. They are lightweight, easy to detect because they are missing a bunch of functionality which a full browser would have. On the other hand, you have high interaction honey clients. So these are basically orchestrated full browsers. Uh, originally, this was, this was Cuckoo Sandbox, for example, while low interaction honey clients were uh, an example of a low interaction honey client was Tug. This brings us to uh, our problem statement for this research. Uh, we noticed that uh, malicious content delivery via the web is still a prevalent threat. Uh, using this kind of cloaking makes it more difficult to deal with because for an analyst it's not as easy or someone doing discovery it's not as easy to find these malicious uh, web pages or how they are delivering the malicious payload. Uh, thirdly, there is no recent comprehensive list of these techniques that can be used. And then there were a couple of aspects which had never been uh, discussed in prior research. 
for example, the effectiveness of these only clients in dealing with generic cloaking techniques. So that's not very advanced techniques, but just simple things like I show an alert, can you click on OK and then get the payload or not? Uh, secondly, and there was also no research into the awareness and the preparedness of organizations to deal with uh, such a scenario. So there's a bunch of contributions. Uh, first one is we reviewed the existing paper which uh, was describing techniques that could uh, analyze the effectiveness of such chronic clients. Uh, we reviewed that. We uh, mentioned which techniques we think make sense. We added some ourselves and then implemented a uh, demo website which shows some of these techniques and which can be used to uh, test a home client, for example. So the website is currently available as well at this URL. Mm -hmm. Then we used a couple of only clients and we, we basically tested them using this uh, website and uh, compared the results. We proposed a couple of improvements to them. And then we get into the, the main things I want to talk about in the remainder of the talk. Uh, so we also looked at uh, how we can, if we see such an attack, uh, how we can share that with others using, for example, MISP. Is there existing tooling that allows us to, that, to do that easily or not? And we checked, on top of that, we checked some MISP communities to see if people were actually sharing this kind of information to make, uh, to check if they are aware of this kind of things and share the relevant info. Uh, and finally, we did a survey as well of people uh, working in the cybersecurity field to see if they are aware of this kind of attacks and they know how to deal with that. Uh, last thing, so I will not mention it for further, but we also uh, showed that if you uh, deliver payload with uh, cache control no store header set, then uh, browser artifacts will no uh, cache browser artifacts will no longer uh, contain any malicious payload. So, so if you are using, hoping to use forensic analysis to catch the malicious payload, you, you're out of luck in this case. Okay, going into MISP community analysis. So we, we uh, checked two MISP communities. The first one is the MISP RIF community, which is hosted by Circle, and the other one was COVID-19. So... <laughs> In MISP, there is two, uh, there's a couple of different things you can use to share threat intelligence. Uh, part of them are structured information and the other ones are more unstructured, I would say. So you have labels you can use. Uh, you can put labels in taxonomies and share these with others. So taxonomies uh, make sure that we are speaking the same language. If we use the same taxonomy, we tag, uh, we label the information the same way. So if I, for example, tell you there is a browser fingerprinting taxonomy, please use this to always in, uh, indicate what kind of fingerprinting is being done. Then if I want to uh, later on check which events have this kind of information, I can just search using this label. Same kind of concept are uh, galaxies. And then you have unstructured content, which is, uh, uh, for example, event reports or attribute comments. How did we check whether there was relevant information in these uh, communities? We mostly did string searches, so it's very simple things. We will look for fingerprint, browser, and cloaking. And for some data structures, such as tags, we did a full review of all the data that was available. Uh, results. So for taxonomies, these were the main things that looked a bit similar to browser fingerprinting. As you can see, it's still not uh, very, uh, it's still uh, not granular enough. For example, SciCat, it just mentions fingerprint. Uh, it's not specifying browser what kind of fingerprint. Same thing for malware capabilities. See fingerprint host, environmental awareness, and so on. In galaxies, uh, the main things we found were MITRE attack clusters, for example, drive-by target and drive-by compromise. But again, these are not very uh, clearly indicating that browser fingerprinting was going on. The only clear indication like that we found was the, the tool uh, galaxy, which had a, a rice curry cluster, which clearly indicates a, a kind of tool which is using a browser fingerprinting. In this case, it was using a variant, likely variant of plugin detect, which was uh, openly available uh, fingerprinting script. Object relationships uh, had properties queried and properties queried by. 
We didn't find any results uh, looking specifically into tags and event reports. However, for events, we did find some results. So these are uh, is the list uh, with the UUIDs. And these all, uh, after manual review, these were the ones that were clearly talking about browser fingerprinting as has been discussed early on. Conclusion here was that uh, existing contextualization options uh, are not granular or clear, clear enough. Uh, however, there is some awareness of the community about browser fingerprinting uh, techniques because they, they mentioned uh, this kind of attacks by using, for example, text attributes or comments in uh, mispatterns. Secondly, we had the survey of cybersecurity professionals. So here we mainly wanted uh, to know again whether uh, security professionals were aware that these kind of techniques exist. And secondly, whether they had specific controls in place uh, to deal with them at their organizations. So we had some issues here, uh, issues in the sense that uh, uh, some concerns when we started this survey. First of all, security professionals, they are usually not very keen in sharing information about which technologies they use at their organizations and so on, which makes sense because you give away uh, information that can be used by attackers. So we, we gave the option to fully anonymize uh, the results. Secondly, the way, depending on how you phrase your questions, people can infer uh, what, what the response should be based on the previous question. For example, if I would have said, this research is about browser fingerprinting, now please tell me what you understand when you see this word. Okay, they will already put this in the context of browser fingerprinting, so you might get some different results. We took uh, specific care in the phrasing of our questions to avoid this kind of thing. Uh, on to the results. So the, we had 35 response. Responses mostly from blue team members in the financial and telecommunications sector. Uh, when asking them, okay, which which kind of targeting do you think attackers can use on online or on the when they are uh, delivering malicious web content? Then these are the the results they gave for uh, consolidated results. As you can see, there's only 20% of the people mentioning uh, something like generic browser fingerprinting, which is not a lot. The second result was that uh, if we asked them what what is the risk you perceive uh, for malicious web content delivery attacks versus the same kind of attack but using targeting techniques, then we noticed that the, uh, the ris perceived risk was slightly higher for the ones that are using uh, specific targeting. Uh, asking about uh, generic defenses that uh, they had implemented at their organizations. We see that a lot of, uh, yeah, most people indicated that at least the basic security controls are there. Uh, this is a bit of a skewed, skewed result because there's a lot of people here indicating that browser isolation is used. It's a specific thing you can use uh, to counter uh, drive-by compromise and so on. Uh, but it could be because a lot of respondents were from the same organization. So. Uh, asking about specific controls they had against this uh, fingerprinting, only about 10% indicated they had anything, so again, that's not a lot. Uh, going to the uh, results of this part, again, it showed, uh, it, it kind of validated our results of the previous part uh, of our investigation, which is that the awareness of this kind of techniques is fairly low. Uh, that being said, we did notice that uh, even though they might not have specific defenses against targeted malware delivery, they have generic defenses which cover them for most attacks, so the overall maturity is still good. And then we specifically asked whether anyone could, uh, whether people could give their understanding of what a drive-by target is. Drive-by target, it's a technique listed in MITRE attack, which in my opinion is super unclear. And only one out of the 35 respondents gave a response to this question, which is anywhere similar to this, uh, this technique description in MITRE. So I think, yeah, it kind of, it validated what I said that the name is confu confusing. So limitations of the research, fairly low amount of respondents, and uh, most people were not willing to share their organization details. Future work, potential future work is a, a red team exercise. Uh, creating a taxonomy for MISP. 
and repeating the same survey amongst a bigger audience and or even doing interviews instead of a survey because it would lead to better results. Uh, and finally, I just wanted to say what happened since then because this research was uh, posted in 2021, which is quite some time ago. I did some tricks and I saw, for example, there is a new attack technique since the beginning of this year, which is called hide infrastructure, which in my opinion is much more clear and it covers these kind of use cases as well, if you look at the description. However, again, it's not very granular. So you, uh, if you use this technique, you will have to still speci specify that the, they are hiding infrastructure by using browser fingerprinting. Uh, looking at academic research, uh, it stays a bit uh, the same to what I saw before, is that there's a lot of research into browser fingerprinting as a technique, but not specifically uh, browser fingerprinting as used to deliver malware. Usually it's more, uh, imagine I have a crawler and I'm doing research on how many websites are, are having this particular type of content uh, for academic purposes. These uh, results might be influenced by the fact that some uh, websites, they are blocking bots or crawlers from getting uh, the full content. So I think that would be, what would be nice is if there's some link up and uh, there's more people doing research into cloaking as, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, my main point I wanted to make is that there is, seems to be a low amount of awareness in the community about cloaking. We should increase it so by giving these talks and by providing these kind of uh, websites, I hope to increase the uh, awareness. Thank you. That was my talk. Any questions? Any questions to Jerome? Uh, are you aware of the uh, undetected home driver and uh, undetected home driver? No. No? Because this is a big project. We see that we bypass most of the bot detections. And uh, I wanted to ask, you know, tips on, on what need, could be done in order to, you know, to detect things like this. Uh, I, I would have to check the specific uh, project I have to... Sorry, but so usually... Um, there's a lot of things to check, but so what's often, for example, with these Honey clients, what you will notice is that they will have, they will be missing certain functionality, which a human, uh, uh, which you would expect from a real browser, for example. Uh, an example that was uh, is on the w website is there's a multiple places where you have the user agent, which you can get from the browser. Some uh, some uh, only clients and so on, they change the user agent in one location, but not the other one. So you can look for inconsistencies like that. But I would have to specifically look at the technology to know uh, how that particular one might be detectable. Uh, if you want to read the full thesis, because I couldn't cover everything, that's the URL. Okay, uh, quick question. Um, did you check like the different browsers against am I unique to org fingerprints? Because I, uh, I just checked while you talked like uh, Brave with Tor and the official Tor browser. Brave. Uh, they were both uh, fingerprintable or not? Huh? Were they both fingerprintable? Or they not? were both fingerprintable. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's <laughs> Again, uh, there is so much available for this uh, capturing of attributes that it's, it's like you mentioned. However, if you go to my website, for example, there is some uh, commercially available fingerprinting scripts and some things they can defeat while others they can't. But I think it's, it's just an insane problem because you have to uh, manage to emulate everything and, and always be consistent. Every single thing that you uh, miss, if there's some new functionality that you miss in your changes, for example, then they can already fingerprint you. That's why I think the approach of Tor at least is better than the, the one of Brave. But yeah, as you can see, there is multiple strategies being used, so I guess they have uh, their own reasons. All right. We are out of time for questions. Thank you to Jerome.